Hello and welcome to the program. I am Luke Hunt and today with me is Glenn Falgate who has a wonderful reputation as a journalist with Reuters where he was a television producer. He's since set up TV stations across Asia as a consultant and as a media uh, executive and he has just released his uh, first book which is a title I really do like. Uh, from Phnom Penh with Love, Confessions of a Media Executive. Glenn, welcome to the program. Hi, Luke. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start with the book. It's a, it's a cracking read. I, I quite liked it. It's very much a coming home tale as opposed to uh, an expose on uh, setting up television stations around Asia. How did you, why did you, um, you've got a smile on your face, which the audience can't see, but nevertheless, it, it is a very good read. Well, first thing is, uh, I've actually written it as a radio station set up, but uh, right. yeah, you're right. I mean, anyone that reads it and anyone that knows me um, would basically automatically have the conclusion it's about my 10 years being here in Cambodia, mm -hmm. setting up uh, a TV channel um, in a market at the time of seven, um, working uh, with, in the end, 300 Cambodians um, with some of the hoi polloi, let's say, of, of Cambodia. The ruling elites. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yes, yeah, like, yes, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it, to be honest, it's a bit of fun. I mean, it, it's, it's not often you get to be immersed completely into a society. I mean, I found myself, we started the TV channel um, with 20 people. Right. And in the end, we had 300. So there was a lot of, you know, there's this wacky foreigner suddenly arriving and setting up a TV channel um, in a different language to what, to what he understands, mm -hmm. um, a different culture to what he knows. Right. Um, and so there was kind of a recipe for a lot of, you know, like a lot of fun and, uh, you know, misunderstandings and, sure. uh, you know, from on both sides, I think, basically. But, I mean, one thing I can say is, yeah, I mean, it's in the book, I've, I've done it setting up a radio station because I don't want it to be too, too close to reality, although it is inspired I by... Should, I, I should point out it is fiction. Yeah, it's, it's inspired by real life events, actually, you know, and, right. uh, and some of the characters there, I've, I've embellished some of the characters, I've embellished some of the uh, incidents. Um, but by and large, um, you know, some of the, the funny, you know, we had celebrities ca came in and there was, uh, you know, funny interactions between uh, ourselves, you know, as, you know, let me say locals, and I'll probably include myself in that, mm -hmm. within the first celebrities that came in, um, and this kind of thing. So yeah, I did embellish it, there was a bit of journalistic license there, but, but I have to say that the actual reality was, you know, bore some resemblance to the fiction. <laughs> um, how did you find working with the uh, Hoi Polloi, and how do you find the hoi polloi in Cambodia as opposed to the more ordinary Khmer's that, uh, among the 300 who you employed? Okay, well, I mean, first, I mean, talking about Khmer's, I mean, one thing I, you know, I, I hope to get across in the book is that basically Cambodia, I think, still has, you know, the family values, um, sure. you know, and, uh, you know, like, you know, some of the attributes and the characteristics that maybe, you know, people might have lost in, right. in, in the West. I find Cambodia's a, you know, from top to bottom, a very warm, you know, generous um, people yep. and, you know, many of my expat friends and, you know, probably yourself mm -hmm. as well. People come here thinking, okay, this is a bit strange when you first arrive, but then you find, you know, what a wonderful, warm, welcoming society it is. Um, and, and basically people stay. And, you know, I think basically with Cambodians, um, you know, when, when you get to know them, they're very loyal and very open um, to, you know, to foreigners, you know, coming in, Westerners right. coming in and working alongside. They can't be said of, of all. Um, countries um, around the world. I mean, I've worked in Myanmar. They're a little bit closed, you know, closed, uh, cl closed off. But it's a different, bit, very different society. Yeah, absolutely, a little bit. You know, they're a bit more suspicious here. There's probably a little bit of suspicion to begin with. Right. Um, you don't understand our ways, but then after you break through that, um, then I find that you, you know, I find you know you you would probably be accepted. Right. And I, I really feel that I was accepted, yeah. and, and right. I was accepted. You know, I think by some of the, you know, when it's just, we say the hoi polloi, some of the, uh, you know, like the uh, um, the, the, you know the top class, let's say, and you know, and also through to the you know the middle class, and you know, the, in, and you know, all the way, yep. all the way, I wouldn't say down, but to all the way through, um, so to speak. Yeah. Right. Uh, you arrived in two thousand. Two thousand two. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think people uh, forget uh, back in two thousand and two, the uh, the war in Cambodia had only been over for four years. I mm. mean, there was a lot of reconstruction effort made in the 1990s with UNTAC, but nevertheless, the war didn't finish until 1998. Mm. And uh, the, the, the societal changes since then have been great. And uh, I guess you've contributed to that. 
mass media. Well, mass well, media is extraordinary in Cambodia. Okay. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, there was a there was t- there were seven TV channels there at the time, um, and it was a bit of a free for all in terms of like sales and you know right. advertising. Um, I don't think people realized the value of TV at the time, and it was kind of like a you know like a sell at all costs. One thing we tried to do, well, well, the first thing I should say is when I was asked to set up a TV channel, one, I'd never set up a TV channel before in my life, okay, so I didn't come with a track record. Two, the parent company um, that asked me to do it didn't actually, they, they were actually in the mobile phone sector and they didn't right. really want a TV channel, right? But somehow, I, I, this is, you know, my understanding is that in negotiating a license, somebody along the way said, we need a TV channel. Um, you know, if you're going to have a mobile phone license, you need to set up a TV channel. So. You know, I think the company, whose name I won't mention, but I think people can figure it out if they know me. Um, basically, they, you know, they, they didn't really want to set up a TV channel because it wasn't their core business. So right. along comes this guy. They have to go and get this foreigner from outside who can set up a TV channel. So they find me because I've got a track record of, of sure. know, working with in crazy places. With, you know, having we'll get there too. Yeah, too, by yeah exactly. Way. <laughs> the Reuters. So they probably said, okay, this guy is crazy enough to come to Cambodia and set up a TV channel against the odds. Um, and so that's basically why I kind of uh, I kind of came in, and you know, like I say, I, I was kind of in a, in a way kind of persona. The shareholder who brought me in, um, who was a local Ocnia, was really, really, you know, into TV, right. and I think he was kind of um, uh, um, fighting a battle against the you know his his JV partners who didn't really want TV; they just wanted mobile mobile phones. So when I came in, the people that employed me were kind of like, okay, just. Just kind of get on with it, but don't bother us with it too much, kind of thing. And they didn't really believe in it. Um, so basically, at first, I had a really, really streamlined budget to set it up, and I was allowed about 28 people, I think, in the end. Um, so I set up, we, well, I, we, because I mean, it was a joint effort, we set up a TV channel of like 28 people. And we just, you know, we kind of went for it. And uh, within about a year and a half, it became number one. And then basically the people that employed me, the mobile mobile phone company, thought, hang on, <laughs> this could actually benefit us. You know, so yeah. then I started getting, you know, like support. And then we used to, we were doing like wacky things like concerts and bring the first international celebrities into the country. That's what I was gonna ask actually, is what what appeals to Khmer's because in terms of my reference to the war carrying on mm-hmm. uh, for such a long period, the sort of what we take for granted in other countries simply didn't happen here and to convince a group of businessmen worth an awful mm. lot of money that you know television can work. Yeah. Uh, it seems, seems a bit of an oddity, actually. But, but what what appealed to Khmer's? Where did it work? What what got them in? Okay, I think okay. Well, one thing is this. I mean, you you're right. Going back to 2002, the war hadn't been long over. There wasn't much entertainment, to be right. honest. And if you think about it, you've got a population here that needs to be entertained. You know, they didn't have a lot of disposable income then, quite mm. frankly. Um, they have more now. Um, you know, and that's why you see Khmer's out and about now in restaurants and being entertained and you know going to entertainment parks and cinemas even sure. etc. In those days it wasn't really that. So you know, for example, as a government, you know, you you know if you don't entertain your population, what are they going to do? Bread you know, and circuses gonna, or <laughs> yeah, they're going they're going to basically you know go out there and probably cause mischief. You know, so <laughs> the polite way the polite way of saying it. So that's why I think TV was quite important. So it actually provided a service, in my view, it provided a service. Um, you know, to the government, for example, mm-hmm. um, you know, to, to keep the entertainment, uh, to keep the population entertained. So that's why I think some of the the elite would basically, you know, realise they were providing that service for the gov- for, for the government. Also, it, it helped raise profiles as well. If you're a TV owner, right. um, you know, I know you know certain shareholders benefited from the fact that they have a TV station, um, you know, TV channel, which raises their profile in the eyes of the government and in the eyes of the public. So that's a motivation from the top. Um, in terms of what what did Cambodians like, well, it's funny, well, it's funny, but Cambodians when I arrived, Thai dramas were all the rage. Mm-hmm. But then they had some, there were some political issues with um, with the Thais at the time, and uh, there were some misunderstandings and miscommunications, which led to the burning down of uh, Thai assets in Cambodia. Oh, that was uh, early two thousand three, three January. Yeah. It was about a few months before we went on air. Right. And to be honest, one of the other TV channels at the time uh, was very strong in Thai drama. But almost overnight, because of this political, you know, um, sure. dispute, basically. For the, for the listeners, we're talking about the anti Thai rights in That's 2003, exactly. and uh, it was very nasty. The uh, Thai embassy had only just been uh, rebuilt, yeah. beautiful building, and it was burnt to a cinder, yeah. and the ambassador had to uh, climb over the back wall to escape. 
That's correct, yes. And then there was a, a few other Thai assets around. One of the TV channels, the main one of the main TV channels known for Thai drama and was you know said to have TV links and uh, Thai links and uh, so they actually suffered. I think their some of their library and uh, archive were, was burnt and stuff right. burnt and stuff like that. And I say funny enough, but just but we we were not going to air Thai dramas anyway. We went for we went for Korean dramas. So but kind of overnight Thai dramas suddenly they weren't banned I believe right. at the time, but people didn't air them anymore because of the sensitivities. So and this was just at a time when the Korean wave was coming up, and right. we had you know somehow managed to I think, negotiate some of the best Korean dramas which we put into our prime time, which then basically, as a result, we became a number one TV channel. Like, you know, it took a bit of time, but then boom, we were up there as a number one channel. So it was kind of like uh, somebody's, you know, the political misfortune, let's say, that benefited us at the time. That's, that's right. what I would, say. Um, I would imagine it continued throughout, because then we had uh, the, pre, the uh, border conflict in 2008 yeah. with Thailand as well. Uh, was, yeah, prove it. Yeah, yes. So, yeah. Yeah, well, well, I tried, then Thai dramas went away, but that was just the time when uh, there was the uh, Korean wave was coming up, and K-pop became very, yeah. very big. Um, so when you say that, you know, I might have, uh, not me, but not myself, but we as TV channels, um, you know, CTN and uh, then another channel called MyTV, which we, we, we set up after the success of CTN, um, and we set up CTN International went into the States, but... Um, the CGN and My TV, I think, probably did contribute to a little bit of the development, especially of the youth, right. because they were really, you know, they were really big on Korean dramas and K-pop. So for me, I kind of like noticed the change, let's say, of uh, styles. You know, people started to become, you know, more trendy, and, mm -hmm. and I think it probably was a result of, you know, looking at, you know, K-pop and you know, you know how Koreans have got a, a real South Koreans got a real reputation of being very, very trendy, mm -hmm. stylish, and good looking, and uh, you know, I think that was, you know, people were aspiring to that here, so it might have changed their styles and stuff like that. So, how, as a television producer, how did you uh, find the, the task of writing eighty thousand words? I, I know you have memoirs to come, which we'll get mm -hmm. to in a minute, but how did, in your mindset, how did you go about writing your first book? Okay, well, the first book, um, well, the first book is the, you know, from, from Phnom Penh with Love, right. one, you know, which is about 60, up to about 60,000 words. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I kind of wanted to make that a bit like a Peter Mayle, um, you know, a year in Provence or, you know, Toujours Provence or whatever like that, a bit of like a bit of fun, but sharing, yep. you know, the, you know, the warmth of Cambodia. Uh, and, you know, and, and that all comes out. But, I mean, I found it, can I say? I, I, at one point, I actually wrote down the reality, mm -hmm. you know, like the actual memoir. But then I just, you know, like this is what actually happened. Um, but then I had to kind of elaborate on things and combine characters and sure. personalities and stuff like that. So, so that part of it, as a journalist, as a former journalist, I mean, TV or not, I mean, we used to have to write scripts. And one of the jobs I did when I was in the Reuters TV newsroom was I used to write about forty scripts, fifty scripts a day. Wow. Okay. And you know, some of them would be, would be based on a, a phone call from somebody in a trench in Croatia. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that. Hey, I'm here, and this has just happened, and I'd have to, they, you know, they'd be the camera person with the producer, and I'd you know have to knock out the script because the they didn't have a computer or, or, or you know, whatever in, at that time. But, yep. So no, I mean, I think you have to be, uh, you know, to write to to, to do to go from TV to writing, you know, that many words. You have to be very organized. I think that's the first thing because you know you've got to remember who, especially if it's like a fictionalized mm -hmm. thing. You've got to remember who's who and what you have you said about them, what their age was, and stuff like that. So you really have to be kind of metho methodical about that. And also, I mean, the flow. I found that the flow of, of a fiction book, you know, may be different to a you know, real mem memoir. You know, has to be kind of you know up and down. You know, if a bit, you know, you've got to have a, a bit of light relief here and stuff like that. So that's the kind of consideration you have to do. In the end of the day, it's entertainment, just like a just like a TV you know story or a TV program might be. It's entertainment. You've got to keep people interested. So that's what I try to do with Prom Phnom Penh with Love. Right. Um, you know, there. You know, so you know, so yes, I. Like I say, I've combined certain characters, I've combined certain incidents, uh, changed certain incidents, um, you know, and stuff like this. Um, but like I say, you probably have to be, it takes a lot of concentration. It's pretty hard work to, to write a book. People think, oh, I'm just going to write a book. You know, you're sitting in a bar and says, oh, I'm going to write, I'm working on my book. But actually, it's a lot of hard work. I mean, that, that, that probably took me three or four years, actually, because there's a lot of, I proofread it myself. So right. if, there's, if there's any mistakes in my 
from Phnom Penh would love. Mm. Book, if there's a spelling, I know there's one in one copy. I found one. Okay. Just right. one. Well, that's all down I mean, to me. That's pretty good for a first print. That's that's all down <laughs> to me. But no, I proofread that a lot. Yeah. So, so I wrote it on the laptop, read it, reread it on the laptop, mm. sent it through over to my Kindle to see what it looked like in Kindle, read it, you know, like there. Put it away for a couple of weeks, came back and read it, you know, and then, you, you know, I mean, and also if you've got tools nowadays like Grammarly, for example, that help you out with, uh, yeah. you know, with certain things, you, you know, and stuff like that. So, yeah, how did I find it? Yeah, it's hard work, but it's rewarding, I think, it's satisfying when you actually, uh, you know, see it for yourself. Stretches the brain space yeah. in terms of yeah. how to focus on a lot of things at the same time. Is that an oxymoron? But anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> well, it, I'll tell you a funny thing is that yeah. when I was with Reuters TV, I, at one point, after working with them, you know, for eight, nine years, I said, well, I, I think I'll go into text now, because I always kind of wanted to write. I always wanted to, th I always thought myself, the way, reason I went into journalism was because I always thought, you know, Ernest Hemingway, a bit of adventure, life in the sun, that's, you know, that's the reality. And then the reality is when you do get into journalism, you realize that actually this is pretty damn serious business and people are getting shot at and killed around you, which is the reality, which I'm sure you'll get onto later. But, sure. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I always fancy myself as a writer. Um, and I did a journalism course in, in America where, quite frankly, I don't think I, I learned anything. Sorry, American universities, but I don't, <laughs> don't think I learned really much at all. And then I came back and went into a PR company, worked for a radio station, and then I basically, uh, um, I then basically ended up doing uh, um, a broadcast journalism course, which where I learned, I learned law shorthand in those days, mm, you know, yeah. when you didn't have to right? and all this kind of stuff. You know, it wasn't NCTJ, it was NCT. BJ, National Council for Training Forecast Journalists. Right. So, so that's, you know, I did that. So I kind of went into that discipline, but I really wanted to be a writer to begin with. Fell into TV, and then basically, but then kind of enjoyed the writing, always enjoyed the writing part of it. So that's why I always, you know, kind of came back to doing the, the, the you know, the, the written, you know, the book yep. uh, part of it. So, yeah. Oh, and on that note, uh, your, uh, 80,000 words into your memoirs, which, yeah, should, be a, which should be a great read. I mean, yeah. you've had a fantastic career, Africa, uh, grew up in Bosnia. Libya and yeah. Bosnia. You've seen a lot of a lot of the nastier sides of human human yeah. life in the last... What, that during the 90s, I think, basically. I mean, you right. say during the 90s. I mean, like, during the 90s, I mean, I... I mean, you know, I, I, when I went into broadcast journalism, I was a freelancer at BBC Radio. Um, and then there was a company called Business. Yes. And, and the, the reason I ended up going to Vizmus was because I was sitting there in my digs in my flat doing that broadcast journalism course. And one day, and uh, there was the Bosnia War just moved to you know the former Yugoslavia the war, war there break up of the former Yugoslavia. It moved from Croatia into Bosnia, into Sarajevo. So I was watching this news report with a gentleman called Rob Selius, who was a very well-known cameraman, worked for Reuters, and then later AP. Um, Zimbabwe, the radiation Zimbabwe, uh, I guess we call it now. But uh, he was there and he actually uh, was filming um, in a place called Elidja in Sarajevo, a suburb of Sarajevo. And there was Bosnians and Serbs shooting at one another. And he had his camera and I think he was, he was pointing it around the wall. Um, and uh, I think, I don't know who shot, shot, but somebody shot thinking that his uh, camera lens was a, uh, was a, you know, like an RPG. A RPG, a, a common mistake. So, but they hit the, um, the story, the way the story goes, is that the, the actual bullet or you know hit the a, a drain pipe that he was right. that he was standing next to, which shrapnel went into his arm, and he dropped the camera. And this was all filmed. So there was another, I think it was a BBC camera that captured all this happening. So anyway, so there was this news report came up on Channel Four, and I thought this looks interesting. This, this looks in. I mean, normally people would probably you know like say this these guys are crazy, but I actually me my reaction was say yeah, that looks really interesting. You know, <laughs> there's Rob who I later yeah, he actually uh, he and I um, you know. I did a couple of stories, I think, together in London. I never traveled with them overseas. So I saw this company called Biz News, and then they had a bit of a, as the news report, they had a bit, a bit of a promo show reel of people hanging out of helicopters, you know, during the Iraq war and stuff. And I thought, wow, this is exciting. This is the kind of stuff I'd like to do. So I actually phoned up Biz News and said, hi, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm looking to, to work. You know, I'm, you know, I'm interested in international news. And I mentioned job. Tim Arlott's name, who didn't know me from Adam. And uh, they asked me to go in. And so I went in and I saw this newsroom with all these flashing TV monitors and satellite feeds coming in and feeds from Jerusalem and all this kind of stuff. It looked like, you know, like a, a NASA control room, you know. And anyway, so I went in there, spent a couple of days with them. Long story short, I freelanced with this news just as it was becoming Reuters. 
and right. being taken over by Reuters. And um, you know, I ended up, you know, having freelance, being asked to work for them um, full time. My first assignment was in Iraq in 1994. Nothing happened. Actually, I was just there as a caretaker with a camera. I was sent out there with no, very little camera training and mm -hmm. had to learn very quickly on the job how to operate a camera. So my pictures were all the wrong colors to begin with. <laughs> and then, um, then after that was my first trip. And then I was going to do a second trip for Iraq because we had a rotation. It was kind of mm -hmm. a care caretaker just in case the Brits and the Americans bombed, you know, when Saddam Hussein you know, stepped out of line. Anyway, that was my first trip. Then I went off to Sarajevo and that's where I kind of cut my teeth there. That's where I found out. Very I heavy scene. Yeah, yeah I, was 90, I was there in 1994, which is quiet, but then in 1995, I spent a bit of time there. It started getting very heavy in 1995, yeah. Blown mm -hmm. up in a TV building. Shot at many times. I think there was one month when it was, uh, it was a day, the date that we got blown up in a TV building was June 28, 1995. And that month, I, myself and a Italian cameraman, Flavio Masquez, a good friend of mine, I think we counted about seven times where we, we had shrapnel go through the back of a car one day. And we, Went back to our, the Holiday Inn where we were staying, and uh, both of us in separate rooms had shrapnel in, in the bed. Had we been in the bed, we would have been, you know, pinned and killed. Yeah, and uh, we shot out many times. Had the car wheel, sh you know, car tire shot out. So yeah, it was quite a bit. It was a pretty heavy month. Right. Culminating us getting blown up in a TV building, um, which injured quite a few of our, our friends and colleagues. Um, yeah. So and then they, yeah. So the Sarajevo, that was Sarajevo. So I kind of. Cut my teeth there, and then Kosovo yep. uh, with Taras, who you know. Yes. And, uh, I was with Taras and a few others in Kosovo, and uh, um, and there was also um, Taras was also killed in, in Iraq, um, Iraq uh, uh, during the invasion. Two thousand and three. Yes. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Kosovo, Albania, kind of, uh, the pyramid schemes, uh, Congo, Kinshasa, uh, Congo, uh, Brazzaville, um, Mozambique floods. Uh, Sierra Leone, a couple of trips, best and worst trip, mm -hmm. best trip, I was there two weeks. Do you miss it? Did you, do you miss the life of a reporter as opposed to, well, you have a lovely life now as a television executive, but... Uh... Well, I'm, I'm not really a television, I'm a television consultant now, I, I'm just to clarify, I kind of, and you know, put my own media PR business, so uh, yeah, I was an executive before, right. but I kind of like handed that over to others, so I'm kind of helping them to be the executive now, sure. so, uh, which... Which gives me a bit of freedom, quite, you know, a bit more freedom, you know, rather than because when you actually are an executive for a TV channel, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're really is night and day, and uh, you know, all, all the time you're, you know, so I have a bit more freedom at my age of 57. Um, missing journalism? Um, I, well, yeah, I do. I mean, I love writing a story. That's why I do my writing, you know, books right. and stuff, and you know, and press releases. I don't, you know, I mean, I try to always find an interesting angle for a press release, for example, here for our own company, but. I miss the camaraderie. I mean, look, I mean, we, I, I, everyone tells me that journalism has changed. And I mm -hmm. think, uh, you know, since when I was in the 90s to now, um, the 90s, we, we, we had a certain amount of freedom. You know, we would be sent off to Sarajevo, and if it's up to us, if we wanted to go up to Mount Igman, right. you know, and we wouldn't have to phone the desk and say, hi, can we go up to Mount Igman? we just do it. There's, that's where the story is. We'd go down that road. Yep. Okay, and, um, you know, we'd, you know we'd, we'd assess the situation and just do it. And I'm, I've heard now that, you know, the, it seems I, I've heard that um, you know news agencies and some news organisations are, are more centralised, centrally controlled. I think from the. the I think that's very that, quite I, true. Yeah, that, that's that's what I've heard. Uh, and then we, you know, I know with quite a few media organisations that they cancelled out. You know, the, the bigger small, uh, the bigger bureaus in small countries, locals only. Yeah. Then the regional head offices, say in Bangkok, which would look after Southeast Asia, gone. Yeah. And then it's uh, so it's all the one the decisions are coming from London or New York, uh, and then there's not the same. There's not the number of people on the ground anymore. They expect yeah. one journalist to do everything, and it yeah. can it, it can be a little lonely. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard this. I mean, I tell you, Nick Robinson, who CNN, yep. who, who we were in Sarajevo, he was actually a producer, I believe, in, in uh, Sarajevo when I knew him. Now he's obviously a very well-known correspondent. We went back to a Sarajevo reunion. He was on the same flight as me, and we were talking about the old days. And I remember him, and I'm, I'm sure he doesn't mind me quoting him, um, mm -hmm. you know, not verbatim, but basically, I, you know, I said, when are you going to write your book? Yeah. Yep. He said, honestly, Glenn, there just isn't time. He said, he remembers the first time when he went into Sarajevo, Sarajevo, it took him nine days to do a satellite feed. Right. He said, now you're doing it within like nine, I think nine seconds, or even nine minutes of you know, hitting the ground, you're live. 
you know, yeah. you know what I mean? You're, you know, so now and then you have to do this, file this, and file that. So it seems like the demands, I think, on agency journalists. You know, he's a broadcast journalist. Sure. So the, the, uh, a channel, or a channel journalist. Uh, but agency journalists and everyone, I think the demands are probably higher, probably because of social media, because it's all instant now. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you're not hitting certain bulletins and stuff. I mean, with the agencies, as you know, you know, you've got rolling deadlines anyway all the time. So when everything is happening, you're, you know, you're breaking it all the time. Basically, you're breaking the stories. Do I miss it? Look, I mean, I, I, yeah, I do. I, I, I miss the camaraderie. I mean, there was times when I was setting up the CTN channel here, mm-hmm. um, when I thought I even, you know, reapplied. And I was actually offered a, a job in with Reuters in Beijing um, to go back to my old organisation. In the end, I turned it down because. Uh, um, yeah, for, for personal reasons, but uh, no, I, I do miss it. I've always loved it. I like writing a story. Um, I like, I love the camaraderie of it. I mean, you know, the, you know, you're in places by yourself. You know, you really feel it by yourselves. You know, like in Africa, basically, uh, you're there. And even if you're competing, you know, like Reuters competes against, you know, I think those at those times WTN or APTN and AFP, whatever. But you're, you're to, when you're in those kind of things, it's something that maybe head office doesn't see is. You, you guys are actually helping each other because the chips are down and they absolutely. are Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And people's yeah. lives are at stake. Absolutely. And, um, yeah. I mean, we used to have, uh, you know, AFP photographers, you know, in, jumping in the back of our yep. armored cars in Kosovo. Um, Anya, rest in peace, she died in Afghanistan. Right. Um, and Anya Neelan, Neelan Hart? Uh, yes. Yeah, um, lovely lady. But anyway, she died at the checkpoint in Afghanistan. But, we would travel there, even though Reuters and AFP were kind of competing, but we'd kind of, we'd be together, you know, and uh, help each other, you know, help each other out. When the TV building got blown up, uh, our, my direct competitor, Feridun Hamani, I, you know, I took him to hospital with Rialdo, who was working at the W10 at the time, which is Reuters' direct competitor, you know. And so, you know, when the chips are down, you come together. Um, it's something that head office doesn't see. Um, and nor should they. Exactly, because on paper you're <laughs> competition. That's but right. often, I mean, you know, we used to base it when it got really dangerous, like the day the TV, TV uh, building got blown up in Sarajevo, we became a pool arrangement. And, you know, anything that was filmed in, um, there, there used to be a Sarajevo agency pool, but that was kind of breaking up. As soon as the service fired this rocket and it blew up the TV building, we, boom, we went, went back to pool again. And I, it was me that was in, insisted it, and Reuters insisted pool with AP and WTN, right. um, you know, and stuff like a major that. competition. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, so no, so I do. Yeah, I, I kind of missed that the camaraderie part of it. Would I do it again? I mean, look. I mean, honestly, we filmed ourselves being shot at on the Mig, uh, Mount Eagle Road in Sarajevo. We knew the road so well. We actually knew when to film. So myself and Flavio, Miguel Hill Moreno, rest in peace, uh, who died in Sierra Leone, but he was driving that day. And Flavio had the camera on his shoulder, and I was sitting in the back. Um, and uh, we knew the road so well. We knew we were going to get shot at. So you know. Just said, hey, Fabio, why don't you start filming now? So he put the camera on the shoulder, and uh, boom, boom, two bullets landed right in front of him, two or twenty bullets landed on the dirt right in front of the car, which we got on, got on camera and said to the, there you go, guys, that's us arriving in Sarajevo, you know what I mean? So if people said to me today, go down that road, you know you're going to get shot at. I'd say you're out of your yep. mind, you know what I mean? But then we just kind of... We just kind of got on with it. We knew it was kind of dangerous, but uh, we just kind of got on with it, to be honest. Uh, well, the, the, I think the nature of wars has also changed over the sure. years. Um, mm-hmm. The kind of uh, the nastier side, the nastier attitudes to oh, not no. just journalists, but to medics, to well, people uh, who are non combatants. Uh, yeah. It's. Um, I heard that as well. I mean, the 90s, the journalist was neutral. Right. Um, but then I think basically. This, you know, the Second Iraq War. I think journalists then became commodities for, you know, that could be used um, to blackmail governments or for ransom to, to make money. Um, right. So I think that's what changed about it. So, so journalists became targets. Um, you know, there was some speculation that maybe got blown up the TV building in Sarajevo. Were we targeted, or was it a lucky? You know, were, you know was uh, we heard that somebody was firing mortar from around that area and then take, trying to take out the mortar, not directly attacking, you know, targeting us. Um, it came from certain, certain territories. But so anyway, I don't know. You're right. It has, the nature has changed. But do, do, yeah, I miss uh, I miss those days. Right. Whether it be the same now, I don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What would be your advice for uh, young journalists heading into the game or heading off to trouble spots? Trouble spots. Trouble spots. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, so that's a that's a tough tough question. Can you be prepared? Well. Look, I mean, when I first went to Sarajevo, um, 
you know, you, you think this is some, you know, I thought, well, this is somebody else's war. It's not going to happen to me. Right. You know, but then, you know, bit by bit, you'll find that, you know, it gets closer and closer. Um, so, and I think if you're, if you're, you know, you're, you're, you stick with, I mean, you, okay, I, I mean, to be honest, this is a bit of a throwback question. Okay, for me, when I, when I went to Sarajevo, the, I, I, in a way, I was kind of testing myself. Like, how do I react when a mortar lands? Mm -hmm. Will I be, you know, complete panic or whatever? How will I react when I see my first dead body? These are the kind of things that, right. you know, kind of, I question myself. I remember even speaking with a very good friend of mine called Ellie Biles, um, who's now the Rome TV bureau chief. Um, and she and I went to Sarajevo together. She'd been there a few times. And I said, look, I don't know, I'm not sure how I'm going to react to this. She said, no, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but nobody knows. And it, there is no shame. There's some people, I've known some of the bravest people around who just cannot stand, you know, the, the randomness of mortar. You know, mortars landing because you don't know where they're going to land and what what, what they're going to yeah, do. I'll, I'll, you, I'll, when you're getting shot at, you generally know where it's kind of coming from. But right. in a mortar, you just have no idea. You don't know what you, have, you don't know where to run to or anything like that. And like I say, there's there's no shame in being scared of that. I've known some really brave people who say I just can't handle that. that yeah, kind of stuff. but you, you don't know. And so you know, like my advice to somebody is, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a tough one. Maybe, you know, it'll. My advice is. God, um, Bad things happen. Expect it. Indeed, I've always don't expect to, uh, you know. Yep. Don't expect to come out of it, you know. You come not, out. Not being affected. You somehow. come out changed. Yes, I think so. And some, sometimes for the better, you, you know. I mean, uh, it's, it does put things in perspective. Mm -hmm. in some cases, um, and you know, I mean, you, you know, to do, stick it long enough, well, you invariably will lose friends for sure, and that will affect you, you know, for for a long time, forever. Yes. You know? You carry them with you. Mm. Okay, yeah. So, your second, uh, number one book is out. The second one is on its way. Uh, you've spent almost 20 years in Cambodia. Do you mm. think this will be your your last stop? Do you see yourself uh, being based out of Cambodia or Southeast Asia? Yeah, um, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is how I mean, I mean, my background is I was brought up in Libya from the age of two. Right. Um, I went to British boarding schools, American universities. So, put it this way. This is probably the the place that I've got the most roots okay. out, of, out of you know out of anywhere in the world. So yeah, so this is home actually, and I'm made to feel at home. I must say. And on that note, Glenn Falgate, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luke.